training. I trained here at Liverpool University, um, but I've, I've done various things since, and these days I work as head of policy at the Born Free Foundation. Just a tiny little bit about the organisation I work for. Um, as some of you might know, Born Free was founded uh, back in the early 80s by Virginia McKenna and Bill Travers, who were the actors who acted in the classic 1966 film uh, Born Free and a number of other wildlife related films. And uh, the organisation was originally founded as something called ZooCheck because of concerns that they had about the welfare of some animals in European zoos in particular. So there's very much a sort of animal welfare focus to the history of the charity. Um, these days, Born Free operates on a strong ethical basis. Uh, we try and have an evidence-based, practical and pragmatic approach to our interventions. Uh, and we do this through field conservation, through animal welfare and rescue work, through education and policy work. And it's primarily the policy work that I'm involved with. And we try and operate with an overall philosophy of compassionate conservation, what we call compassionate conservation. Uh, which demands the full consideration of the needs of individual animals and animal welfare in the development and application of conservation best practice. Um, so this morning I'm just going to rattle us through. This is a talk that I actually give to students that usually lasts an hour. I have cut it down a bit, but I'm going to rattle through it fairly quickly because I probably haven't cut it down enough. I'll get into trouble if I'm not careful. So we'll talk very briefly about the state of global biodiversity, the international wildlife trade, its size, scope and impacts, um, the welfare impacts uh, of uh, international wildlife trade and their evaluation, and the provisions within the regulatory framework, both at an international, regional and national level, its limitations. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the outcomes of a big meeting which happened last month in Geneva, uh, something called the CITES Conference of the Parties, which some of you may know something about. And finally, we'll talk very briefly um, uh, about uh, ways forward and ways that we might think that we, that we might want to go in future. Um, in terms of the state of global biodiversity, well, we all know that biodiversity, is, uh, biodiversity and wildlife are under huge pressure. And um, fairly recently, uh, the something rather snappily called the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on, Biologi Bi on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, I can't even say it, ICBES, um, launched a global assessment report on biodiversity and ecosystem services back in May. And this report was put together by over 150 scientists across 50 countries. And it came to a number of very stark and rather depressing conclusions. Um, that nature's decline is unprecedented, that species extinction rates are accelerating, that the current global response is insufficient, that we need transformative change to protect and restore nature, that opposition from vested interests can be overcome for public good, and that probably uh, in excess of a million species are currently threatened with extinction. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that uh, direct exploitation uh, of organisms is identified as the second most important driver of these declines and obviously international wildlife trade is a significant part of that direct exploitation. Uh, so international wildlife trade involves hundreds of millions of uh, individual plants and animals belonging to tens of thousands of species. Its value is measured in hundreds of billions of US dollars um, and the trade has both legal and illegal components. It's growing pretty much exponentially, partly as a result of human population growth and as a result of the massive growth in, uh, in disposable incomes among, among various people across the world, which means that they can now afford to buy products that perhaps uh, they wouldn't have been able to in the past. Um, and uh, it has many purposes. Uh, wildlife is traded internationally for many reasons, as food, as traditional medicine, uh, as pets or companion animals or status symbols, uh, as ornaments uh, for the purposes of entertainment, for zoos, for parks, for as photo props and so forth, uh, and of course for animals in research and various other uh, purposes as well. Um, so it's a very varied um, trade. Um, if we look at the legal trade, uh, I mentioned CITES before, this is the UN Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species and uh, it maintains a trade database 
uh, where transactions, international transactions uh, for trade in species or parts and products derived from them that are listed on the CITES, uh, on the CITES convention uh, are recorded, uh, they're collected, so you can go in and interrogate this trade database. Um, so what we see from the database are increasing transactions involving these listed species of animals and plants. And in 2016, the number of recorded transactions reached uh, in excess of 1.2 million. Um, and the legal trade under CITES is valued at something like $320 billion annually. Uh, if you just look at the live trade within that, and I looked at data for 2017, which is pr probably the most recent year that we have some kind of uh, complete data set for, um, there were something like 45,000 transactions involving live animals, and they included 2.2 million reptiles, 587,000 birds, 53,000 mammals, 47,000 amphibians. So lots and lots and lots of live animals in trade. Now, bear in mind, this is just the reported legal cross-border trade in animals and species listed on the CITES appendices for one year. Uh, and so the total amount of, of trade going on uh, is much, much greater than this. And of course, uh, wildlife trade has a very large illegal component. Uh, it's generally still seen as being a low risk, high return business, um, with something like a 90% chance of criminals going undetected and unprosecuted, those criminals who are involved in uh, illegal international wildlife trade. There are close links to organized crime, close links to militia, and there have been reported close links to terrorist groups. And Estimates vary, it's very difficult to estimate the total value of an illegal trade because uh, there isn't any official collection of data. Um, but its estimated value is something in the region of 260 billion US dollars, 90% uh, of which is illegal trade in fish and timber. Um, and uh, with, just within the EU alone, something like 2,500 seizures of illegally traded wildlife products are made in the EU each year. Um, and uh, this involves everything from the high profile trafficking of high value products like ivory and rhino horn to high volume trade in animals like pangolins, roughly a million of which are estimated to have been trafficked over the past decade for their scales, uh, for traditional medicines and their meat. Um, and of course the trade in things like live birds and live reptiles for the exotic pet markets and many, many, many other aspects to this illegal trade. Um, if we have a look at how this trade is spread across the world, drawing on some of the excellent work by Sandra Baker and her colleagues at Wild Crew at Oxford University from 2013 in their paper, Rough Trade, uh, which tried to assess the literature on uh, wildlife trade, um, it's interesting to see that Asia predominates as a source, transit, and destination hub for wildlife trade. Uh, Africa and Central South America are significant and, I would argue, increasing sources of uh, animals and products and plants for wildlife trade. And Europe and North America are significant destinations, so this is truly a global issue. And uh, the literature on wildlife um, in both legal and illegal trade uh, indicates that luxury goods uh, and food represent the biggest driver alongside traditional medicines uh, and the supply of animals for pets and entertainment purposes. Uh, the literature tends to be weighted towards reports on mammals, possibly reflecting great public interest uh, and concern for mammals over other taxa. And judging by the available information, around three quarters of animals in trade are wild caught. Uh, and these trends are pretty consistent across different parts of the world. Um, if we think about the impacts of international wildlife trade, well, it has a wide range of impacts. Um, arguably, the most significant are the negative impacts in terms of conservation through biodiversity and species loss, negative impacts on biodiversity through the introduction of invasive species, the potential spread of disease to other animals, uh, the potential impacts on human health, for example, salmonellosis from reptiles, SARS, Ebola, they've all been linked to wildlife trade. And the economic, social, and political implications of illegal trade and the involvement of organized crime. Uh, the impacts on animal welfare are clearly hugely significant, and we'll come to them in a minute, although they receive rel relatively little attention. 
Uh, it's also important to consider that to many people, the trading wildlife and wildlife products brings positive benefits through the provision of animal protein into otherwise protein-poor diets, the supply of medicinal products, creation of job opportunities, the fueling of local economies, and the cultural significance of many wild animals and products derived from them. So while you know we tend to view wildlife trade, international wildlife trade, as a negative thing from a biodiversity perspective, we have to think about the context with which other people, particularly uh, people at the supply end uh, of the uh, um, of the wildlife trade, may 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 view these these issues. Uh, again, from uh, Sandra Baker et al's study uh, of the suggested interventions found in the liter literature to mitigate the negative impacts on wildlife trade, only two percent were directed at uh, changes designed to benefit animal welfare directly, and this really demonstrates the lack of a research focus on welfare, which may in turn reflect a lack of perceived priority for welfare among policymakers and the enforcement community. So we need to consider that welfare impact should be taken into account, that we need to consider that evaluating, when we're trying to evaluate the welfare impacts of international trade, we need to take into account the intensity and duration of suffering that animals might experience, and of course the number of animals which suffer, but this is anything but a simple business. Um, because of the large numbers of species in trade, the large geographic and cultural spread and the huge variety of uses to which wild animals and products obtained from them are put, the impacts of trade on animal welfare are massively varied, but they can to some extent be categorised. You can look at the direct welfare impacts on the target animals. Uh, you can think about the indirect welfare impacts on additional animals that might suffer de death or injury or social disruption as a result of trade. Uh, and this can actually result in um, uh, suffering on a very, very large scale. For example, for every ch young chimpanzee or gibbon captured from the wild for sale into the pet or photo prop industry, several of its family members will likely have been killed. And the survivors will undoubtedly suffer the consequences of having their social structures seriously, often irretrievably damaged. And uh, the targeting of animals with dependent young will have huge consequences for, consequences for the surviving dependent, which in the case of this baby rhino would most likely starve or be predated without expert protection and care. And there's increase, increasing interest in the consideration of the social and cultural implications of removing animals from populations and the potential long-term impacts for the stability and functionality of animal groups and wider ecosystems. So very broadly, there are three circumstances in which wild animals are handled in trade. Uh, many animals are killed in situ in order that parts from them can be removed and traded. Uh, animals may also be captured live to be killed later uh, somewhere else. Or animals may be captured and uh, in order to be traded live. And the potential welfare concerns and possible inter interventions in order to mitigate them are going to vary between these various scenarios. So for animals killed in situ, uh, well, the welfare imp impacts are likely to be focused on the period immediately before and at the time of killing. And the duration is often, but not always, short, and the intensity of suffering in numbers of animals involved can be relatively high. And there might be useful parallels to be drawn with uh, slaughter processes for livestock, uh, the killing of wild animals for disease or pest control purposes, or euthanasia guidelines uh, for the, from the likes of the American Veterinary Medical Association. But where animals are killed illegally by poachers, the welfare of the animals is going to be of little concern and there, there will be little or no opportunity for any kind of oversight as to what's going on. So for instance, elephants killed for their ivory or rhinos killed for their, killed for their horns. Uh, in these cases, the animals are often left alive. Uh, sometimes they've been sedated using veterinary drugs in order to mask the, the sound of guns and so forth so that the poachers don't get detected. And they'll often sort of recover from having half their faces chopped off and, and then uh, die a very slow and painful death over quite a long period of time. Uh, so in that case, the welfare impacts are clearly very, very high indeed. In terms of live capture, either for killing later, for live trade or for extractive use, um, 
the uh, welfare can be impacted across the entire supply chain. Um, and the duration and intensity of suffering experience and the number of animals experiencing it are all highly variable but can be very, very high indeed. Uh, I use an example of, for instance, primates as pets in the, here in the UK. Um, um, there's quite a lot of primates that people keep as pets and a lot of those animals will live quite long lives in captivity but in very poor condition from the point of view of their uh, psychological and social health. So those animals can suffer over very, very long periods of time. And in terms of capture for extractive use, like bears for barrel farming in China, uh, this can result in years and years of suffering <coughs> with a huge range of health and welfare impacts uh, of long-term incarceration and in this case bile extraction and these can vary from severe behavioural problems to long-term nutritional deficiencies, severe developmental abnormalities, chronic infections, neoplasia and, uh, and many other um, problems. So this is a really, really serious uh, issue. Um, of course, incidental mortality and mor morbidity is a big issue for animals captured for the live trade. There are high levels of mortality and morbidity through the capture and transport process often, and uh, poor conditions at final destination can lead to very high levels of mortality. Um, so uh, African grey parrots, for example, traded for exotic pet markets. Mortality through the trade process can be as high as 90%. And yet the trade can remain profitable because the money that's made from the 10% that survive can still, uh, can still uh, be profitable for the traders. And pet reptiles with uh, um, uh, a natural life expectancy of anything up to 120 years may have something like a 75% annual mortality rate when they're kept in people's homes. So, and uh, incidental losses increase pressure on wild populations. If a lot of the animals that you're collecting for trade die during the trading process, then you're going to put more pressure on those wild populations as traders and traffickers go back to collect more animals to replace the ones that have been lost, leading to further animal suffering. And of course, captive breeding operations, which are often cited as being ways of supplying wild animals or products without impacting uh, species conservation, also come with a host of potential welfare problems, including poor husbandry, uh, inadequate environment, poor nutrition, inappropriate social groupings, or inad inadequate uh, health care. And many of these captive facilities still capture wild animals uh, as a, 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 a replacement stock. So I'm going to, I, I knew this would happen, I'm going to run out of time here. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly to finish off about regulation. Now it's fair to say that wildlife trade regulation at international and domestic levels is, I think it's fair to say, failing to protect many wild animals at ecological and individual levels. But welfare related provisions do exist at a number of levels. Uh, we've talked about CITES briefly before. It's the main international agreement regulating wildlife trade. And while its stated, its stated aim is about ensuring that trade doesn't uh, adversely threaten the survival of species, so it's primarily about conservation rather than welfare. Um, it does have a number of provisions uh, that relate to uh, directly to the welfare of animals in trade. And these include um, the uh, state, states of export and imports for live animals being satisfied that the destination for a living specimen will be uh, suitably equipped to house and care for it, and that uh, living specimens will be prepared and shipped to minimise the risk of injury, damage, or health or cruel treatment. And there are also provisions within CITES relating to live animal transport, confiscations and how they're handled, uh, and captive breeding operations and a number of, of other issues. The problem with CITES uh, lies around <coughs> who is responsible for implementing these uh, uh, these uh, provisions, how they're interpreted, and in general a lack of guidance to authorities on how they're supposed to go about uh, making the determinations they're expected to make, uh, and uh, the accountability around uh, which they can be held. And I'm just going to finish off very briefly by explaining a couple of things that happened at the CITES conference of the parties which recently took place in Geneva. Um, just to give you a, a, an idea of where we're getting to on some of these things, that conference of the parties agreed generic non-binding guidance 
on how importing authorities should determine whether facilities for Appendix 1 listed live animals and some other populations of elephants and rhinos in Appendix 2, um, whether they are suitably equipped or appropriate and acceptable to house those animals. Now, these are the guidelines. Now, I'm not going to try and read through them, but they talk about physical housing, <coughs> species-specific enclosure furnishings, animal care and husbandry, dietary needs, veterinary and animal care, wildlife laws, social well-being and animal behaviour, uh, the management processes and any other tax on specific considerations. Now, bear in mind, these are really generic, and I'm sure you'd agree these are really generic, but to get to this point where we've actually got non-binding generic guidance within the CITES process on how authorities are supposed to go about making these kinds of determination has probably been the culmination of about nine years of intensive work. And we do have a process by which this is now going to be assessed and hopefully we'll be able to build on this with much more specific and species specific guidance which is going to enable us ultimately to hold authorities to account in terms of, of how they go about uh, making these kinds of determinations. So at that point, I'm going to uh, wind up. Uh, there's a, a lot more to say about international and national legislation. I'm happy to talk to anyone else.